Hello, good evening. I'm Oral Gibbs, and welcome to Oral Gibbs Live. And my guest on the program this evening, for the first time, but his father's been here many times, and also speaking of everything, is Mr. Chris Johnson. Mr. Chris Johnson is currently the Dutch government representative in St. Martin. Mr. Johnson, welcome to Oral Gibbs Live. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, and thank you very much for having me. I have, uh, this, like you said, it's my first time on the show, but I have uh -huh. watched you many times over the years. It's uh, been a pleasure. Well, thank you for being here this evening to talk about uh, your work and, and other things in terms of the, uh, that loan or grant we'll find out later on from the Dutch government. But I want to go back first a little bit about yourself because uh, the, last, the first time I met you actually was in August of 2010. I don't know if you remember that. I was in mm -hmm. Sabre for um, an interview with then, the then Dutch Minister Bellabel, and that's where I met you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that was a busy period for me. Uh, during that period, I was commissioner for, for nine years on SABA, and uh, that's when we spoke. And uh, so that's a little bit of how I ended up in, in this position. Um, you know, like you said, my father is a very well known figure over here. Uh, so I grew up on SABA um, as the son of uh, the famous Mr. Will Johnson. He's on the screen right now. We have a picture of him on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was a lot younger in that picture there, right, so right. hopefully we'll have him here in the studio at some point uh, again also. And uh, for me, it always always had a dream of having an interview with him at some point, so it'd be nice if the two of us can uh, come in here at some point, talk about old political stories and referendas and, and all of that. That would be nice. I would really love that, to have that. So let him know the invitation is open. Absolutely. Will do. Will do. So now you're the Dutch government representative to St. Martin. What's it all about? Um, well, for almost two years now, I um, have been here working for the Dutch government on St. Martin. And like we said, I was in politics uh, for 10 years, actually, and I was commissioner for nine years on Sable. And after we had the evaluation of uh, Lisbeth Spies, mm -hmm. the Spies Committee for the Bass Islands, I announced in The Hague that I was going to be stepping down from politics, um, at least for a while. And it was a very busy period, and um, you know, going through being a commissioner for four years in the Netherlands Antilles, and then for five years as a commissioner as a public entity, it was a natural moment for me to to look to something different. So when I told them that, I was asked then by different representatives from the Dutch government if I would be interested in coming here to St. Martin. Um, at the time, I said, okay, I have to talk to my family, and then. Um, yeah, I looked into it and said, okay, this would be something for me, my wife, and we have four kids. So, of course, it was a big move to yeah. come over here. Um, so, until Irma, let's just say that my office uh, is called the VNP, Vertegenwoordiging van Nederland en Philipsburg. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's somewhat of a quiet office, let's say. Um, we have to be honest that, you know, St. Martin was coming into its own after 10, 10, 10. Uh, we know from the Netherlands, sometimes the opinion of the islands uh, can be a bit varied. So during that period, it was you know, somewhat, let's say, quieter. Of course, we hosted many delegations. Uh, we had a lot of contact with the government of St. Martin. But overall, I would say a normal eight to five job, uh, you know, helping where I can and, and helping also here in the local government of whatever knowledge I could bring over. After Irma, uh, there was a dramatic change in that. You know, we saw, uh, of course, we all went through it. I was here as well. I happened to also be here in Hurricane Lewis. So I don't know if I'm the, the bad luck. So you experienced both of them? <laughs> I experienced both of them. Lewis, I was passing through in 95. Uh -huh. uh, but this one, I was here with, uh, with my wife and four kids. So this one's quite different when you have small children in, in the house yeah. as well. Um, but as we know, the king and Minister Plasterk were actually on the ground about five days after the storm. And what took place then was that we had a civil mission. Uh, we had two things happening at the same time. Of course, it was called a civil mil mission because it was also the military mission. Mm -hmm. So there was up to 850 military personnel on the island uh, immediately after Irma, a little bit before as well. And it was actually one of the largest um, campaigns by the Dutch military since Iraq. So when you're talking about uh, the Netherlands and its military, moving 850 personnel and within a five-day period, you know, is, is quite a challenge. So we had the military mission, of course, and we had the civil mission. After the visit of the king and Minister Plaster, um, within that week we had, but the next day people started coming, and within less than a week we had uh, 16 professionals on the ground from the different ministries of the Dutch government. 
So that was the beginning of the civil mission and let's say a huge change in what I do and what my office does uh, overall. You know, of course, we jumped right in where we could. We offered to help where we could. We had almost daily meetings uh, with the government, uh, with the governor, across the board, um, emergency response teams, daily briefings from the, the military every day at 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know, so really uh, jumping right in there and seeing what could be possible, where we could help. And I think from that point on has been quite a change in what we do as an office. There was quite a number of evacuations taking place at that time too. Yeah, there was a lot of evacuations. We had an air bridge set up uh, between St. Martin and Curacao, so via the military. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was also uh, via boats. There was the first assistance started at the harbor, at the airport, and at the prison, actually. Mm -hmm. And then we know, I mean, what took place was, was more than could be expected. I mean, those of us who know hurricanes knew that it was going to be very bad. Yeah. Uh, I recall, you know, just speaking to people around me that hadn't really seen it. Oh, I've seen Omar, I've seen Gonzalo. I said, no, you haven't seen anything of what this will be. So, um, yeah, there was help needed all over. There were experts needed, you know. So between the civil mission and military, uh, we were highly involved at the time. Yeah. And I noticed also the U.S. government had quite some evacuations of their own with their military aircraft. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was down at the airport a number of times uh, within short, and mm. as you know, I mean, the aircraft were, were coming and going. And um, yeah, it was just still amazing for me to think back of seeing thousands of people there lined up, uh, you know, just trying to get off. I mean, I, I remember a similar situation after Lewis. Uh, you know, I was with a cousin of mine here, and I remember seeing just being at the airport days uh, on the end of people just sleeping in the old airport building, just waiting every day hearing that American Airlines wasn't coming or what have you. What have you. So this time seeing the ev evacuations was yeah. really impressive. And this was really more dramatic than the, those than 95. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that one was for me, uh, you know, just to look back for a second, but yeah. you know, now you had days to prepare, you have the internet, you have those type of things, you know, you really knew that something heavy was going to hit. In 95 it was a special on ABC News and there's a big hurricane approaching the Caribbean. I mean, mm -hmm. to predict how severe it would be, that part has gotten much better. Um, but like you said, it was a complete difference. Huh? No, so basically, uh, you would say that uh, your your job actually increased after Hurricane uh, Irma. Then uh, I always tell people, I say that uh, Lewis, uh, you know, was an experience, mm. and Irma changed my life. So um, yeah, my job, our job, changed because of the fact that, of course, right afterwards we saw a response from the Kingdom Partners, mm. and uh, absolutely needed, necessary. So Martin was completely down and out. Um, so the whole nature of the relationship changed and then you had you know a huge interaction and of course we all know what followed talking about uh, conditions talking about uh, you know uh, an amount being named as uh, for money that could could come over and could help so yeah if my office or since my office is a liaison in between the Dutch government and the St. Martin government yeah. that hugely intensified after Hurricane Irma. Now we hear a lot about 550 million euros now yeah. of that total amount how much is a grant and how much is a loan okay well um, maybe let me back up a little bit and, and I will get to that because okay. uh, you know I still know that there's a lot of confusion oh. on the island as to what's taking place um, we had the emergency phase was the first part and that was a total of 55 million euros uh, that was spent by by the Dutch government and that was completely uh, Minister Plastak came ahead of time and he said, this one's on us. So we had the cattle doorman coming, uh, all of the different uh, vehicles and all of that, and uh, the troops and the genie and, and all of the assistance. That was considered an emergency phase. Mm -hmm. and that was kingdom partners helping each other as should be done based on the statute. On the 10th of November, I think it was, um, we heard the number of 550 million euros. What that number is, is actually a reservation on the Dutch budget. So um, if you make a budget, and in the Dutch government, they make a multi-annual budget. Mm -hmm. So they have a, what they call a post, um, you know, a, a point on the agenda, on the budget, that has an amount listed on it. So that amount is 550 million euros in total, and that is for the reconstruction, the rebuilding of St. Martin. Now, that is, uh, like I said, just a post, uh, post on the Dutch budget. Mm -hmm. 
With that, there were three forms of assistance that are given out. So we have direct support, which includes liquidity support for the budget of St. Martin, which includes help in the areas of justice, uh, extra police officers, also the establishment of an integrity chamber, and um, the, the border control issues. Then we had an amount of seven million towards early recovery projects. Those are the international, mainly international NGOs, but also local NGOs. So the Red Cross, White and Yellow Cross, SMDF, uh, roofing, roofing projects, debris projects, um, you know, training for pay type of programs. And then we have the bulk of the money, which is 470 million euros, um, which is in the process of being transferred to the World Bank and establishment of a trust fund for St. Martin. So uh, whether you ask whether it's a loan, whether it's a grant, the money in the trust fund, 470 million euros, is a grant. It is called a single donor, single recipient um, trust fund. The donor, the single donor is the Netherlands. The single recipient is to be St. Martin, mm -hmm. and that money is a grant. The reason why I think you hear um, different uh, misconceptions about mm -hmm. it is that when that trust fund is established, the St. Martin government then becomes in the lead. It becomes uh, the main player in the, in the trust fund. So setting up, um, you know, whether it's housing uh, roofing programs, mm -hmm. whether it's training programs for individuals, economic stimulus packages, or what have you. Now in those, there is the possibility that St. Martin in the lead can try to establish some loan programs for SMEs, um, you know, or uh, small to medium enterprises, but also maybe larger mm -hmm. industries, that they can say, okay, uh, we will make a, a revolving fund inside of that. We will um, provide low interest loans. They've had discussions about that in Parliament, what have you. Now, those can be loans to be paid back to the trust fund. And that means that St. Martin will get more leverage, if you will. They'll get more use out of the trust fund. But there is no big debt that will be waiting to be paid back um, to the Dutch government by St. Martin. Right, that's, that's a big concern of a lot of people. Absolutely. And t to be honest, um, well, I, I shouldn't say I'm too surprised, but um, you know, the transfer of information mm -hmm. is very important. And we have been saying this and repeating this, and that's why I thank you that I could be here today yeah. to discuss with you again. Um, you know, uh, you still get those things, is it a loan, is it a grant? And then I hear the explanation, and then I hear even radio programs that I've been on. And then I heard uh, the next day the radio personality <laughs> saying, we don't know if it's a loan or a grant. <laughs> so um, uh, I understand the concern and I understand the confusion, but the money to the trust fund mm -hmm. is a grant from the Netherlands. That means there is no repayment to be made to the Netherlands for the trust fund money. And that's 470 million euros. That is to be 470 okay. million euros. Now, what takes place with that? And um, we had last week, Monday, on the 16th of, um, of April, yeah. there was a signing of the administration agreement between the Netherlands and the World Bank. And what that did was it released the first tranche of money. The schedule for the, re uh, for the payment of the trust fund, it's a so-called front-loaded trust fund. Mm. Um, so there will be four tranches that will be made, four large payments made over to the trust fund. Okay. The first one was in a total of 112 million euros. And the way the agreement is, and this can, is a public agreement, uh, anybody can access it, uh, states that this was the first payment, the first tranche made over to the trust fund. The second one will be October of this year, then March of next year, and then October of next year. So okay. by October of 2019, the full amount 470 million euros can be deposited in the trust fund. Now, there of course are some conditions on that, or conditions maybe is not the right word, but uh, we have to see how the progress is going. 470 million euros is also a lot of money to be spent. There's also issues like the absorption capacity of uh, St. Martin, you know, how much can you spend at right. once. So there's gonna be something set up which is called a steering committee. And a steering committee will include a member from St. Martin, uh, a member from the Netherlands, who was already named, Mr. Franz Wakers, and a member from the World Bank. And this steering committee will meet officially uh, twice per year, unofficially many other times, and they will be monitoring the progress of the trust fund. And as the trust fund is being used, then the idea is that these tranches shall go ahead and be deposited tr to the trust fund. I have to mention that the deposits can be made up till the end of 2021. So money can be continuously placed mm -hmm. in the trust fund until almost the beginning of 2022. 
so 31st of January, on uh, 31st of December 2021. Oh. The trust fund itself can actually be used until 2025. So what you have is that um, the transfer of money takes place over the next few years, and even if there's a delay, it can continue taking place mm -hmm. until 2022, the end of 2021. And then the money in the trust fund can be spent up till 2025, the end of 2025. Now, I think the reason why a lot of people are saying that uh, it's a loan is because they question why the Netherlands had to use the World Bank to administer the loan and not do what they did, say, in 95, use the foundation? Um, well, I think, you know, the Netherlands is uh, represented on the World Bank, and there had to be, there was going to be some institution that was going to be used. So in this sense, um, you know, having it as a trust fund is where the bank part comes from the World Bank. So, you know, it's a huge deposit of money sitting there, uh, you know, in their accounts. So I think that's more the issue of, let's say, the bank part of the World Bank. But also the, the World Bank, um, maybe you've seen, they just did some projects uh, down in Dominica, they're in the process there. They focus a lot on uh, rebuilding and reconstruction. Now I can tell you that during the time frame of it, um, there were many institutions that were asking to be the ones to administer um, the money. You know, uh, from USONA, uh, mm -hmm. IMF, uh, you name it, everybody of course wanted to be the ones to administer it. So, you know, they were going to choose an institution and they looked at the World Bank as being, um, you know, international organization with a good name, with some familiarity in the Caribbean, with experts in many different areas that really could, could be the ones to manage this amount of money. Now, um, we're speaking about 550 million. You said 470 million is a trust fund. Yep. Then there's... Uh, 80 million left. That's a loan? Uh, well, there was liquidity support that was given, um, if you follow that, right. from the 2017 budget amendments. So that was a total of 24 million euros. Um, I think there was also a restructuring of a loan before that. That was given as, uh, as a loan, um, a, a zero interest loan, uh, okay. so no interest to Samaritan, uh, no repayment for the first five years. You know, you have to remember that there are financial laws that uh, guide the relationship between between the countries. So the consensus Rijkswetter, as mm -hmm. uh, they call them in Dutch, and uh, the financial laws that were agreed to on 10 10 10. So based on those financial laws, uh, if you have liquidity support or a, an injection to be made in the budget of one of the autonomous countries, mm -hmm. uh, through the CFT, there is a configuration of making that as a loan. So they use that so that they could speed up the process and get the money there. But officially, that is a loan um, based on the agreement. And like I said, there's no repayment for the first five years. Okay. And then it's over a 25-year period uh, with 0% interest. Now, you said $7 million went to NGOs? $7 million for early recovery projects. All right. And that has already been uh, dispersed? It's in the process of being dispersed. The early recovery projects can run up till the end of June. Mm -hmm. so, uh, June of this year? June of this year, yeah. yeah. So that was also looked at at the time when discussions were taking place with the World Bank as uh, a need, you know, sort of bridging the gap, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, for those in very severe need. So um, it includes uh, some roofing projects by Red Cross, UNDP, also the uh, Food for the Kids program, that's also part of the early recovery projects. Um, uh, there's debris cleanup by UNDP, uh, SMDF, uh, Mr. Keith Franca and, and group, you know, uh, having also some housing projects. The White Yellow Cross, there's also training programs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some done with the White Yellow Cross together um, by Milton Peters, and afternoon programs. So retraining for carpentry, retraining for nurses. Um, so a lot of different smaller projects that could be quickly implemented, quickly executed, so that, like I said, that gap yeah. in between something was taking place. I think people don't realize the extent of the damage today as we speak. You drive around the island, you go off onto side roads, and you see the amount of homes that are still uh, without a roof. And for most of these people, some of them have no insurance. Can they look forward to assistance from this uh, part of this loan? Well, uh, 
Are you saying lawn again? <laughs> but, <laughs> no. All right. Well, I think that, like I said, there's different uh, aspects to, to the recovery process. I guess the reason why I said that is because I don't see the, the, the government giving uh, free money to people. Well, no, I, I wouldn't say that. But, but let me, let me mm. say that uh, each, each entity has its role, right? Okay. So the role of the Netherlands has been, in this sense, to, to make this money available, yeah. to establish the trust fund, and to make the mechanisms, if you will, available for the use of it. The one in the forefront for the use of the trust fund is um, St. Martin. And uh, so we have to look towards um, you know, the Council of Ministers, the St. Martin government, with its own uh, responsibility, about the types of projects that will come. Now, those projects, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term NRRP, Mm. That's the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. And the National Recovery and Resilience Plan is in draft form right now, which is being collaborated between the World Bank and St. Martin. And then this plan will have to become, or will become the plan of St. Martin. So things that are spent in the trust fund have to be covered um, in that National Recovery and Resilience Plan. But absolutely, housing, they have to be IRMA related. So uh, housing repair, uh, you know, and so forth is is absolutely um, there and included. There's always issues of you know to whether houses are insured or not. Mm -hmm. um, I guess income levels play a role, all those type of things. But you know, already from the Dutch government, we saw in the early recovery plans, or we've seen that there is roofing repair taking place. But absolutely agree with you about the the need out there, the sense of urgency um, is of utmost importance. No, I, I know that there. Conditions uh, and part of those conditions led to the fall of the previous government in terms of the integrity chamber and uh, border control. How far are we in these two areas right now? Uh, I think both of those are going very well in the sense of uh, at least the opinion of, of the Dutch government. Um, uh, the St. Martin government has been very cooperative now with uh, both of those issues. Uh, I think the, the border control, in my opinion, was never really that much of an issue anyway, because there have been marriages here and all that long before, so there was always cooperation. But what was the real reason? Because I think most the average citizen still doesn't understand when they hear border control. Maybe if you can probably just yeah. elucidate on that quite a bit. Well, I think at the time they were looking to, um, you know, if you're putting uh, half, over half a billion euros, mm. so long over a billion guilders on the table, um, to make sure that the environment in which that money is spent uh, is one that is suitable, let's say, to the investment you're going to make. Yeah. And of course, um, we all agree, let's call it an obligation, but the goodwill between the partners, you know, but um, if you're going to spend that much uh, amount of money, you want to make sure that things are done in the right way. And I think we can all agree, um, you know, regardless of our views of immigration, uh, uh, but see, Martin, the data has been very difficult to, to receive for the last 40 years, you know, knowing who's living here legally, who's not living here yeah. legally, you know, how it functions as, as a country um, is important. And it's not only important to, to those of us who are legal residents here, but to those who are illegal residents as well. You know, when you're an illegal, you cannot travel properly uh, because if you leave, you can't come back. Um, you know, you have issues with health care, educating your kids. Uh, you are a captive, you know, in a place that you are an illegal. So it's, if you look at through a human rights aspect, um, it's, it's not a nice status to be in when you have that many people living in uncertainty. So the border control was talking about the professionalization of the institutions and helping with capacity. Mm. St. Martin has a lot of good institutions, um, but we can all use a little help when it comes to, to increase capacity. Now, the integrity chamber is one where we can go on for hours on, but uh, I know local politicians and many other people on the island didn't see the need for the integrity chamber, uh, though the Dutch government see it differently. Um, can you explain that very briefly, please? Well, the integrity chamber also was one that was a discussion taking place uh, for years, going back to the protocol of uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. So the fact that, you know, um, I think during the time uh, there was also a feeling from the side of the Netherlands that we'd like to go ahead and, and get this, uh, you know, resolved and uh, the issue clarified oh. and, and done. So 
Um, you know, I'm not in politics anymore, so I have to tread lightly, if yeah. I will. Uh, you know, I don't want to make any polit political statements. But I think, um, you know, uh, we have to be careful as a society, you know, if words like integrity and accountability and transparency, mm -hmm. if these words become negative in our own society, then I think we have to, to be careful. So, um, you know, at the time, myself, uh, you know, when we're looking at the uh, integrity chamber, you know, uh, yeah, those are aspects that I don't feel infringe on people's rights. I actually feel can help uh, develop society. But like I said, yeah. I'm not in politics, um, but those were the conditions that were set by, by the Dutch government. Uh -huh. And, yeah, like you said, we all know what took place at, at that time. All right, so, so now, uh, Mr. Johnson, when you, when you look at Simradin, and it's a relatively small island, um, it's shared by two European nations, uh, France and um, the Netherlands. You, as the representative here for the Netherlands, how is the relationship for you, with your office and say uh, the office on the French side? Is there any communication, cooperation from that aspect? Uh, actually, what we have in my office, or a uh, person in my office who is directly from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, mm -hmm. from the Netherlands. So from the beginning with the civil mission, we always had a member from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so what we do is that that person is the one who is the first point of contact uh, for the authorities on the French side, but uh -huh. Prefer and uh, Mr. Daniel Gibbs and, and what have you. And there is a, a big discussion about you know, how to move forward with possibility of EU funding and cooperation. I mean, for me, you know, uh, I've had the opportunity to travel for work. And when I look at places like the Virgin Islands, and I see the US Virgin Islands and the British Virgin Islands, the US Virgin Islands, I believe, is the only American territory that drives on the left. And they right. do so because of the influence of the British Virgin mm -hmm. Islands. The British Virgin Islands is the only place that British place that uses the US dollar and they do so because of the influence of the US Virgin Islands. They have yearly um, uh, cooperation between the Coast Guard, the military, the police force. They have special visas for each other to move back and forth and you see people from St. Thomas working on Tartola and what have you. And here we are and that's uh, two areas with loads of islands in, mm -hmm. in between them and uh, with population centers all spread out. And here we are on one island, uh, 37 square miles, and uh, we have two different forms of uh, electricity, three different currencies, if you use the euro, the dollar, the gilda, um, you know, uh, two different languages, two different regimes, one is more uh, business uh, oriented and one is more social set. You know, for me personally, of course, as, as a kid of the Windward Islands, I always felt it would be in St. Martin's benefit mm -hmm. and advantage to, to look towards cooperation. You have a hub function here that is second to none in the Northeast Caribbean. St. Martin, the Dutch side, is the natural leader of the Northeast Caribbean. So with that position, if it's taken um, you know, in that leadership role, there I think is an amazing amount that can be done with the French side, with St. Bart's, with Anguilla, with Seba, Stacia. You know, uh, embracing that and, and, and showing that leadership, I think, is, is a great thing for St. Martin. So wherever we could help, we'd gladly do so. All right. Uh, we have to go to a break. When we come back, we'll continue speaking with uh, Mr. Johnson right here on our Oral Group Live. Please stay with us. At SXM, we're taking travel and tourism to new heights. Here we boast spacious check-in areas, 10 passport control points, comfortable departure lounges, and an exciting new airport mall. Finally, there's an airport in the Caribbean that takes your travel plans as seriously as you do. Princess Juliana International Airport. 
In case you've just joined us, you're watching Oral Gibbs Live. My guest on the program this evening is uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Chris Johnson is the Dutch representative here in St. Martin, and we're here to speak with him. You know, Mr. Johnson, um, Mr. Halliger, who's a former tour, mentioned in the paper that uh, he would like to see $50 million go towards the airport because right now the Princess Juliana International Airport is having some issues with the insurance claim on the damage of the property. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, first and foremost, I think uh, it sounds like a very good idea. As he quoted in the article, he put it as an out-of-the-box mm. uh, way. And I think uh, we need more of that. We need more thoughts about how to stimulate the economy, how to, to kickstart, um, you know, and, and get jobs rolling here and get people coming in. So. 100% uh, in agreement that it's a good idea. You know, I think what needs to be made clear is the roles of the different uh, groups here. We have the Netherlands, like we said, as the, as the donor towards the trust fund. And we have um, St. Martin as the recipient of the trust fund. So actually St. Martin will be the one in the lead of how projects are executed, what type of projects come to the table, what are the priorities of the government, uh, you know, so it's while it, I think it's it's an excellent idea, it has to be more of an internal discussion um, between the within the government of St. Martin, mm -hmm. together with a, a project bureau, and with the World Bank to see first and foremost does it fit in the NRRP, mm -hmm. that's the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, you know, and um, you know, so does it line up with those projects, and do they want to uh, support that and initiate that? as a project. But again, that is more, uh, the ball is more in the court of St. Martin to make that, make that a reality. I also uh, heard that their conditions in terms of their criteria as what can come into consideration also with the World Bank. Yeah, well, um, you know, we have, uh, I think I touched on it earlier and I just mentioned it as, what's called the National Recovery and Resilience That's Plan. That's where the, the, the criteria is in that. Yeah, well, that, that go, it's a national plan that looks over the entire island, and that's talking about about $2 billion worth of damage um, overall. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an overall figure for damage on the island. That also includes properties that are damaged that can be covered by insurance. So that includes everything. There's a difference between what is the national plan national damage and loss assessment mm. and what is government's responsibilities. Um, so that plan creates uh, like a, a bit of a road map, if you will, and lays the path on the way forward. So, I mean, which is, which is just logical. And, and when you're talking about $2 billion uh, worth of damage, there is a lot of room, a lot of different areas and sectors, you know, where the money can be spent. Mm. The money has to be Irma related. I mean, that's of course obvious. What's been a very good development in the last two months uh, from the side of the Netherlands is that first it was looked at as just a national recovery plan. So the money had to be spent on, in that sense, recovery from Irma. Now we're hearing the word resilience included, and that's a very mm -hmm. important development because that goes along with the idea of building back better. You know, your economy also needs to be resilient, so new initiatives can be taken. Um, you know, buildings are not just recovering from the damage, but also need to be better for the future. Now we're looking at the size of the storms that are coming, they're getting bigger, um, more vicious. You know, so that idea of resilience opens a whole new world of being able to also look uh, towards the future and see what additional items can be built out of that. So, in other words, that um, mainly, because sometimes it, it's a little confusing in terms of how this disbursement will take place in terms of the government of Samaritan, because they'll hear that the government of Samaritan is responsible for identifying, but then you hear the World Bank will say, well, you know, this doesn't really fit in here. And I'm, I'm hearing that discussion a lot more in private from a lot of people who are yeah. connected with the whole affair. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, you say, yeah, the, the, the government is the one that has to mm -hmm. lead the way and look to what's taking place. Um, but like I said, it needs to fit in that overall scheme. Uh, you know, uh, we see the, the mega yacht of Abramovich out there and things like that. You know, the, the money can't just be used to buy a yacht or you know, something. It has to fit mm -hmm. into the scheme of that. Um, the World Bank regulations should 
dictate more on procurement, which is uh, what we call open bidding and all right. that. So they have set rules on how bidding processes are done, how projects are monitored. But then let me explain maybe a little bit more about um, what is envisioned. Because, but again, mm -hmm. th this is the responsibility of CIMART. And so I don't want to be misleading to say that this is the Netherlands responsibility. But the way it stands right now is that there has been a creation of an interim project bureau. So there's a certain number of um, projects that are being fast-tracked fast that have already been worked on from before the signing of the administration agreement on the 16th of April. Um, and this interim project bureau is within the government of St. Martin and is the entity that is uh, you know, looking at projects, looking at the scope of projects and, and how to move forward with those. In the future, there should come uh, a project bureau overall. And that project bureau will have to be with project writers, project implementers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen in the past, if you remember, they had the Social Economic Initiative, uh, the SAI projects called, yeah. USONA projects, AMFO projects. All of those have to have a project leader, they have to have project writers, there has to be supervision to make sure that companies deliver what they said they would deliver. So that will have to be a whole process of, of, of uh, projects taking place. And that should go through a project bureau in the future. Looking at the World Bank procurement uh, procedures, uh, there's a lot of concern about this small island. And you have the World Bank come in, don't understand the culture of St. Martin and the dynamics involved in it. You're trying to tell people, well, you know, you have to go and put XYZ project on bid. And it opened up St. Martin now to compete with the outer world. And that is creating a number of problems. Probably people don't say it, but I'm telling you this is what people are saying to me, is that the World Bank procurement procedures and what needs to be done is basically shutting out the very island that they want to assist because then local business can't compete with outside. Well, one of the priorities, actually, um, and this goes back to actually when the, when the conditions were there. We mm -hmm. talked earlier about uh, the integrity chamber and uh, border control. Right. Uh, there was a third condition, actually, at the time, and that was maximizing the use of the lo local labor market. Uh, so without a doubt, that uh, has the attention of the Dutch government, as much as can be. Um, and those are discussions that have to take place in the steering committee and looking at the procedures of the World Bank. I agree that the World Bank doesn't maybe have that much familiarity with St. Martin. However, they have done a lot of work in, in the region. They're doing work in Dominica right now, um, doing work in Barbuda. You know, they have a complete Latin American and Caribbean uh, department. So, you know, uh, they also understand that there's pressure on them to, to produce. And but there are certain things, without a doubt, uh, that are, I can see that problems will arise. I mean, St. Martin pre-Irma was a, a tourism economy, not a construction economy. Right. So when you're looking at an entire island that needs to be rebuilt, um, you know, that's, that's very difficult regardless. I mean, there wasn't a uh, hundred construction companies just sitting, waiting at the time, because like you said, most of the labor force is in the hospitality sector. Mm -hmm. So it's also a bit naive to think that, um, I'm not calling you naive, but in general discussions I have, of thinking that uh, we'll be able to do everything locally. Uh, however, uh, like I said, it was one of the conditions and is a priority to use the local labor force as much as possible. But I agree 100%. I mean, we'll have to see how that plays out, and uh, that's going to uh, bring yeah. difficulties regardless. I, I, and the, the reason why I'm going to bring this up is because uh, there's a certain project that doesn't require any sophistication expertise. And that particular project, I understand, was mentioned to the World Bank, and they wanted to put it out on bid. See, and it was just not necessary because here we have about five, six local companies that have been doing that over the years. And I'm being very, very evasive right now because I don't want to mention what the project no, is. Yeah, I can understand. But it is a project that really, and I can tell you, Mr. Johnson, has nothing to do with any real sophistication, expertise in construction. So I hope that when the time comes around that the World Bank 
needs to work really close with Simran, that the Dutch government will also understand that there really are some areas where we, our people, our companies can do it themselves and that they will get that opportunity and they won't have to compete with outside forces for these simple projects, which I'll tell you after the show's over what it's about. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, I can imagine, uh, you know, that, that those situations arise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, you have to remember. I mean, I was when I was commissioner, and I remember, uh, you know, what we had uh, through social economic mm -hmm. initiative, USONA projects, AMFO projects. Actually, all of those had to go on bid. Also, I think there's a difference of looking at um, whether, first of all, it's a bid or if it's too open to foreign markets. Remember, local companies also have advantages. Uh, which they need to use. You have your, your labor force here. If you're a local company, your workers live here, they reside here. Um, you know, if your bid is competitive and you're going in to, to get something, if a company has to mobilize 100 people here or, or do whatever, that has to cost a lot of money. So as a local company, you need to, to know those things, use those to your advantage, and go out there. But yeah, the World Bank is going to be using a bidding process, absolutely. The Garbage dump in the center of the Great Salt Pond. I'm thinking here, you know, there are a lot of people live on this island. A whole lot of Dutch people live on this island right now. And you know, a thousand. <laughs> Pardon, how many? <laughs> Four. Oh well, there's 20, 22,000 voters. Yeah. So and then you look at the kids. So you probably have 30,000 Dutch citizens. Yeah. Yeah. We all we all Dutch. And you know, and then you you, you have well, you know, look, if you. If you speak to local people, uh, they will say, well, you know, we might be Dutch, but we're not really Dutch. They, they look at European Dutch as a little different, and that's unfortunate, but that's a reality. Passports are all the same. That's the reality. Um, what's the Dutch government thinking about this situation right now? Because it's, it's an urgent, urgent matter that can't be delayed anymore. And, and I, I'll be the last person to tell you that I want the Dutch to come in and solve that problem. You know why? Because that's our problem. We should fix it. But apparently, our political leadership has taken years dragging their feet and did nothing about it. Now it's an emergency. Yeah, well, um, like I said, we're all Dutch. Mm -hmm. And I also saw the letter from the SHTA, uh, was in the newspaper, was that last week, addressed to the king, yeah. you know, what have you. Um, you know, since the steering committee was not established yet, it has not been established yet, there have been some let's say, guiding principles uh, or discussion about priorities for the first tranche of, of money, for mm -hmm. the first 112 million euros. Um, the first priority is waste management. And then it includes uh, also good governance and what they call mobility. So uh, we've already touched on the airport, and now you're touching on, uh, uh, on the dump. So uh, those, both of those are listed as what should be priorities to be executed within the first uh, tranche of, of money. Mm -hmm. So um, in that sense, I mean, that already shows the sense of urgency from the side of the Netherlands, um, you know, of first and foremost, making money available to help. Second, uh, putting this as one of the three priorities for the first tranche of, of money to be spent. Uh, but like I said, I mean, there, there has to be a role of, of each entity. And I can say that just uh, earlier today, I was in a meeting uh, with the Minister of Roaming, uh, specifically about, about the dump, about cooperation where is possible. When the State Secretary was here last time, uh, Raymond Knops, he also mentioned that as one of the areas that should be explored together with the French side. You know, um, when you look at EU funding, which can be in addition to uh, yeah. the trust fund, you know, um, you can't cooperate in every way. I talked about the, the Virgin Islands and all that, but you can't, uh, you know, we do speak two different languages. You, so for education, for different areas, it's tough to cooperate. But environmental issues, waste management issues, I don't think there's anybody on either side of the island that would look to that as a negative thing. Um, you know, so that's being encouraged all the time uh, by the Dutch government. Uh, like I said, State Secretary Knops, that was his main message last time he was here. It has been put as one of the priorities. And the trust fund is, is now open and ready to go. So, um, you know, it, it's, I understand the urgency. I live in Little Bay Hill, and, uh, you know, usually the wind is blowing the smoke also straight to, to my house. Um, but also I heard, you know, that it's 
I've known it's been a problem for many, many, many years. And it's unfortunate to see sometimes it seems like when it's smoking, it's a problem for everybody. And within a, a day, we West Indians, we, we seem to forget pretty quickly. As soon as the smoke eases up, mm -hmm. we put it on a back burner. But let's hope that enough momentum um, is behind it right now and coming with, with that amount of money sitting on the table and having it as a top priority that uh, we will see the ball rolling. And I must say to the Minister of Romy, um, you know, our, from our meeting this morning, that was what the meeting was about. He said this was his uh, you know, top priority. And it was encouraging to hear that. So. There are a number of uh, Dutch police officers still on the island. Um, is the payment for that coming out of the trust fund also? Oh, that's a great question. Um, actually, when you talked about the 470 and then the additional 80, um, I touched on uh, the liquidity support. Yeah. That wasn't a pr uh, part of a loan. I touched on the early recovery projects. Um, the, that actually was a grant. Uh, also, that doesn't have to be paid back. And then we have a budget available for direct support. And when we're looking at areas specifically uh, with regards to justice, yeah. it's been a long conversation of uh, not using the World Bank for that. There is no need if we're talking about, you know, the police support, uh, Marish de support coming over from the Dutch government, that, that that would have to go through the World Bank. The World Bank doesn't have expertise in justice and definitely not to the level of the Netherlands or of St. Martin. So we've seen a, a good cooperation taking place there. And yeah, and that's a separate um, amount of money from the 470 of the trust fund. All right. We'll be right back right in Oral Dukes Lab with uh, Mr. Johnson. Please stay with us. At Najiko, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like knowing you're fully covered after an accident. The security of your home and everything in it that means so much to you. And knowing that even when the weather does its worst, you and your family are covered. At Nagico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. In case you've just joined us, you're watching Oral Groups Live. I'm here speaking with uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson is the Dutch government representative in St. Martin, and we're speaking with him. We always make jokes in the program about the 550 million euros. Now, tonight he explained to us what it's all about. Now, Mr. Johnson, uh, um, I think a lot of people on the island, I must say, this time around, is very grateful to the Dutch government for their assistance after Hurricane Irma. I don't know if you sense that. Absolutely. I must say um, that afterwards also, especially when the military was here, we saw the, the, the outpouring of support. Um, you know, I, I visited more places in St. Martin than I had in my whole life before that since Irma, mm -hmm. and people's homes and uh, cried tears together. I've heard the military referred to as the angels in green. and. Um, so absolutely, and that message uh, has been loud and clear, uh, you know, to the Dutch government and, and, and all that. So I must say, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud uh, of what the kingdom has done because it's not only the Netherlands, also uh, Curaçao and, and Aruba also helped with some police support. And it shows that even though we can fight, um, as they say, a friend in need is a friend indeed. And I think we saw that very clearly happen after Irma. So, you know, a lot of times we don't know what is this kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, you know, I originally come from Seba, that's its own thing, Estatia, St. Martin, Curaçao, Aruba, and Bonaire, really separate, yeah. and then a European part of the Netherlands. But when we need each other, in this sense, um, it was encouraging to see. Yeah. What has surprised you most about this work that you're doing? Um, what has surprised me most? Uh, I don't know. I, I would say... Um, what I'm the most grateful for is to be able to, to help a bit in that sense. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, maybe get a little personal now, but, you know, nine years in politics uh, or as a commissioner in a small community was, was, was a lot. And when I came here, you know, the job was a bit uh, more quiet. And, uh, and that was all right. I had a little break mm -hmm. and, you know, spending more time with the kids and all that and very nice. But um, uh, what has encouraged me let's say, is the chance to make a, a real change here for me personally. 
And what I'm encouraged with also is, is meeting a lot of people that positively contribute to C. Martin. You know, I've been uh, blessed in a sense to meet with a lot in, in civil society. Uh, you know, we used to talk about government and government to government. But when you look at NGOs here and you look at different clubs on the island and you look at what a lot of people do, um, that is very encouraging. So uh, in that sense, um, I'm pleased about that and I'm pleased about the goodwill of people and, uh, and, and really impressed, you know. So uh, I also think what's very important about looking forward is that, you know, this can also be a real opportunity. When we look to, uh, you know, what took place in St. Martin in the past and what can mm. be possible for the future, you know, how often do you get a chance to reset um, in many different areas? We know that, you know, St. Martin uh, had issues with, with a lot of illegals living here. And I'm not saying it as a, as a legal problem, but I mean of, of seeing who's on this island, how are things run on this island. Um, you know, you look to everything from tax structures to infrastructure to what have you. And with all the terrible things of Irma, when we see the support and when we see something like a trust fund, I think it's actually can also be an opportunity uh, to be seized and to truly build back better, and that's building back society better. You know, um, you're the first Windman Islander to hold that position. In the past, uh, a lot of people view that office with a lot of suspicion. <laughs> So how did they receive you in Sim <laughs> <laughs> Well, when I, when I first got a position, I was told by a, a good friend, a good lawyer on the island, I won't mention his name, a certain junior, <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, oh, you're going to be the next Dutch spy. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, wow, OK, well, that's, uh, you know, that's how you, you view the position. Um, <laughs> but you know, I must say, uh, from the beginning, you know, here I am, a Windward Islander. Like you said, my family's from the Windward Island for, for 400 years. Um, but I work for the Dutch government. And mm -hmm. for the Dutch government also, I work for them, but also I'm from down here. So both sides have looked at me, uh, you know, with curiosity. The, the, the Windward Islanders say, he's one of us, but he works for them. Mm -hmm. And the Dutch say, well, he's one of them, but he works for us, you know? So uh, absolutely, uh, no doubt about it. I, I see it from both sides of, of people looking at, uh, what do I bring to the mm -hmm. table? But my main, hope is that I can bring comfort to both sides. A lot of times I see an information gap. I see uh, that in Saint, not just St. Martin, but mm -hmm. Sabre Station, the islands, we don't understand Dutch politics. We don't understand the lobbying and the Hague and the way it works and, and uh, how you have to work in through the civil servant apparatus and how you have mm -hmm. to especially lobby and get things done. And, and they also don't understand the island mentality. They want to know how come there's not more protests down here, uh -huh. or, or you know, how come you all? Really? Yeah, how come you don't plan for 30 years in advance? Uh -huh. I told them, I said, you know, in the Caribbean, often we live hurricane to hurricane. Mm -hmm. So not year to year. I'll tell you, in Hurricane Hugo in '89, '95, Lewis, '99, Lenny. Um, you know, so these are things that. I, I try to show them what it's mm -hmm. like to live on an island, how we live together uh, in small communities, uh, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, and hope that that helps the situation. I think what is so unfortunate is that there's a whole huge divide between, say, the Caribbean Dutch and that in, the, in Europe in terms of understanding. And uh, I've been to Holland a few times, and it's like, I'm treated so good. The first time I went, I was very suspicious, you know? And I think if we can work together and get to understand each other, after 400 plus years, I think th there's still a lot of misunderstanding. Absolutely, I agree. Um, one of, I, I, I use it a lot in discussions. I always say that there's the emotional part, mm -hmm. And then there's the professional part. And there will always be emotions. There's emotions. We, as West Indians, are uh, emotional people. But there's history. There's all types of different realities. There's differences in cultures. All of those are the emotional aspect of the kingdom. My hope is that we can divide the two. We can be professional, um, you know, so learn to work through the statute and rules and regulations and how to lobby and how to do our business and, and operate as a professional kingdom. 
but that we still have the emotions, but that we're able to, to move the two. You know, in politics, we, we always used to talk about not taking things personally. You have to be able to sit in an island council meeting or parliament and throw blows and afterwards be able to talk to the person. And, and, and mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I think for me, uh, I would like to see that develop. And I want to say that uh, one time I took a group of people uh, over to USM. This was uh, over a year ago. And we met with over 20 young people and we had a nice talk and, and all that. And I asked a question. I said, what does the kingdom mean to you? And we had all different responses. Um, but I will say I was very encouraged to see that there was not that emotional discussion about the history and about this. And all. It was more of a discussion about opportunity and um, you know, being connected uh, with each other and what this can mean for young students in the yeah. form of education and, and what have you. And it was nice for me to see that those young people had their mind in the right place about how do you take advantage of us having this collaboration with each other, globalization, you know, look, mm. and not necessarily bring in, well, who said this and who said that and who's a crook and who's a thief and which history. And so it, it's, it would be nice to see that separation. All right. So, Mr. Johnson, I want to thank you for coming in. Anything you'd like to add in, in closing? Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here, and I just want to say also to uh, people in the community, um, you know, uh, thank you for welcoming me and receiving me on your island. I, I'm really uh, glad to be here. From the smaller islands, I don't know, um, we also seen each other on Save a few different times, yeah. but, you know, from St. Martin, sometimes I think people don't realize the fact of how close the other islands look towards St. Martin. So, yeah. you know, I grew up on Seba, yes. But um, I was out here every, every month of my life. And, and um, you know, so also people from Stacia, St. Bars, from Anguilla. St. Martin, we all feel a little piece of St. Martin is also ours. Mm -hmm. And uh, we root for it and, and we hope for all the best for it. And I just want to say thank you for those who have taken me in and, and accepted me here. I appreciate it and I hope that I can be of some benefit and help this island. I want to thank you. And again, I want to ask you to Remind your father, invitations open. I'd like to have both of you back. Will do. <laughs> thank Absolutely. you. Thank you again. And that's it for now. I'll see you next time right here on Oral Gibbs Live. Until then, good night. Take care. Bye.